Welcome, everybody. This is Beersmith episode number 100, and it's mid-March 2015, since I lost the first episode way back in 2010. We've had over 1.8 million downloads, and you can listen to all 100 episodes streaming around the clock at beersmithradio.com or watch them on my Beersmith YouTube channel. Thank you to this week's sponsor, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're now offering a full six issues a year, up from four at a great discount. They're offering a new discount code now, which gives you 15% off everything they sell, including subscriptions and training. The new code is Beersmith2015. I encourage you to check out this great new magazine for homebrewers at beerandbrewing.com and use the offer code Beersmith2015 to get your 15% discount today. And also, Bruja, the Bruja BIAC, is a full control brewing system in which all aspects of beer making, from water heating to fermentation, occur in just one high-quality stainless steel vessel. It takes up less space, requires less time, and costs less money than a traditional brewing system, while still offering full control and repeatability. Check out the Bruja BIAC at BrujaEquipment.com. And finally, a quick mention on the How to Brew Extract and All Grain video series that I co-hosted with my guest, John Palmer. Learn how to brew with extract or all grain from this two-part series, available on DVD or streaming to your favorite mobile device. You can learn more or purchase these videos at beersmith.com DVD or on Amazon. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today we're celebrating episode number 100, and I have two very distinguished guests with me. First, I have John Palmer, who is the author of How to Brew, probably the most widely read book on the planet in homebrewing. John uh, spends most of his days traveling around the country talking about beer. How you doing, John? Good. John also recorded the uh, How to Brew video series with me last year. Had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, you can find out more about that at beersmith.com slash DVD. John, it's uh, great to have you on the show. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. And also, uh, in the Challenger's Corner, I have Randy Mosher, whose new book, uh, Mastering Homebrew, that we covered a couple episodes back, may give John a run for the money. Uh, I think it's set to become a brewing classic. Randy is uh, also the author of Radical Brewing and Tasting Beer, and he joins us from Chicago. Randy, it's uh, great to have you on the show. Uh, great to be here. Uh, congratulations on 100 episodes. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing to me. I think we're up to 1.8 million downloads. Not bad, huh? Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, great to have you guys both on episode number one hundred. And today we're going to do a series of tough home brewing questions uh, from both extract and all grain brewers. And uh, I'm going to give John and Randy a stab at answering all of them and see what their opinions are. Hopefully, this will be a little bit of fun. Uh, let's start with an extract question. A lot of us were uh, told early on that you get a cidery taste from brewing an extract with too much sugar. Truth or myth? What do you think, John? Well, I think there is some truth to it. Um, I know I've I brewed several cidery batches in my early in my days, um, and I think a lot of it has to do with yeast stress, not so much uh, brewing with refined sugar, but as a problem of uh, you know the wrong pitching rate, the in- inadequate yeast nutri- nutrition. Uh, causing stress on the yeast and, and causing you know, that cidery taste. Do you think it mostly comes from uh, yeast and not actually the sugar then? That, that's my feeling, yes. Yeah. How about you, Randy? Well, those old recipes back in the day were three pounds of sugar and three pounds of stale canned extract with a dried up packet of yeast on top. That sounds about right. Yeah, bread yeast, I think, <laughs> is what they used. definitely use. made some pretty cidery beer. I remember it was like batch two or batch three before I realized that the yeast – Inside that packet shouldn't be one melted block of stuff. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and avoid the rusty cans that are bulging. So, I mean, I think I haven't had a cidery, cidery beer in a long time uh, because the extract is a lot fresher now. And um, uh, people aren't using those massive doses of corn sugar. Yeah, the corn sugar, I think, is a big factor. I, one of the things I noticed early on, too, is a lot of the um, ingredients I used to buy back in the day were stale. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know yeah. The, the extract had been sitting on the shelf for a long time well and everybody wanted to try all those different kinds of uh you know stout extract and 
pale ale extract and and it, you know the the trend now is just use one kind of extract and get your flavor elsewhere but people were using those different different cans which meant there were 20 30 different cans of extract mm-hmm. sitting around the shops just getting st- waiting for somebody to come by and buy them so they sat there and and uh, got a lot of uh, oxidation as they sat on the shelf mm-hmm. Um, next question related to that is, uh, do you prefer to use dry yeast or liquid yeast? And what are some of the advantages of each? Uh, let's start with Randy this time. Well, I'll always take uh, liquid yeast if I'm given a choice, but um, mm-hmm. dry yeast is great as a backup. Uh, definitely, if you're uh, brewing some beer and you're a little questionable about your yeast practices, keep a packet or two of that stuff on hand, and and then you've got an instant rescue for yourself if, if you screw things up for some reason. But the great thing about brew, about liquid st- liquid yeast is that they're truly identifiable pedigreed brewing strains. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, whereas the, uh, the, the yeast in the packets is, is had by, by necessity is selected for yeast that will endure that uh, process. So you never exactly know what its pedigree is. Is that true? You don't, you actually can't trace the uh, pedigree for some of those yeasts? For some, that's true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and they've all been kind of developed by those yeast companies to work with their dehydration process. It doesn't make them bad, but, uh, you know, if you're trying to nail that Fuller's Ale yeast character from Lund, you know, the London ESB type of yeast, you you may have a hard time doing that with, with liquid. You just don't have as many choices. Mm-hmm. John, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I pretty much agree with Randy on this. Uh, I prefer liquid strains just because it, you know, it's it's that extra um, extra ingredient in your repertoire for for producing um, a particular style of beer, or you know, kind of perfecting a you know a favorite recipe. Um, the yeast strain can have a very large effect on the flavor of the beer. Um, dry yeast is great. I mean, there, and there's a lot more variety of dry yeast now mm-hmm. than there used to be. So. You know, whether it's uh, Fermentus or Lalamond, Danstar, um, or, you know, any of the other companies, um, there's even, there are even some lager strains available these days that are, are good. So, uh, you know, that I think there's really no reason uh, to shy away from dry yeast, but, um, you know, as depending on how you like to brew, if, uh, if, you know, getting the details uh, as close as you can is uh, is your game. Then a liquid yeast may serve you better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen some uh, much better quality dry yeast come out now, and I I use them as a backup still. But uh, but I think I go most of the time with dry with uh, liquid yeast, obviously. Yeah. Lalamond has a saison even now. So yeah, nice. That's a nice one. Yeah, nice. Uh, well, let's go to the next one. Uh, we've seen a real explosion of the brew in a bag as a method. Um, makes it very easy to get into all grain, for example. Uh, what are your thoughts on whether this is as efficient as a traditional uh, traditional mash? John? Um, well, I haven't I haven't used the the method myself, uh, you know mm-hmm. for uh, regular brewing. Um, I've done it once or twice over the years just to to try it out and see see how it worked. And I I thought the the efficiency isn't bad. Um I do much better in efficiency with my regular uh three tier system, you know, three vessel system. Mm-hmm. Um I think part of my uh feelings on the subject is I just enjoy building equipment and using three vessel systems and you know, I guess me, I'm just a stick in the mud and I enjoy doing it the way I do it. So, uh, the, it, the brew in the bag is, is convenient for a lot of people, but to me, it takes some of the fun out of the process in terms of what I enjoy about home brewing. So, yeah, I, that, I, th- you, I think there's no question it's less efficient just in terms of, uh, the product efficiency, but when you factor in time, then you've got a different kind of efficiency and I think right. the beauty of the beauty of those uh, Bruna bag systems is that they really are not terribly more difficult than extract brewing. So you really have a, a shorter time window for brewing. You don't, does, not going to take your whole Saturday, and uh, so you get in, you get out, and you've made an all grain beer. And if you have to throw away a pound of malt 
in terms of less efficiency, you know, we can afford that. It's not like uh, mm-hmm. home brewing is on a tight budget and we have to uh, scrape every little drop of uh, wort out of the grain. So uh, I say roll with it. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, related to this, I often get questions about mashing with a lot of water, you know, like three quarts per pound, four quarts per pound, which is often done with brew in a bag, uh, also done with nose sparge and, and even some traditional decoction mashes. Um, is there a problem really mashing at these high water to grain ratios? Uh, let's throw it over to Randy. Not really. I mean, I think if you look at the factors that affect the efficiency of the mash, um, it's number three or four or five down the list in terms of, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of ways you would control your mash temperature is obviously your main tool for controlling that, uh, sugar to, uh, well, t- controlling the ratio of fermentable to unfermentable sugars mm-hmm. in your, in your mash and, uh, thickness is just one, one tool. So generally in the context, uh, it's really, the thickness is usually more adjusted for mechanical purposes, say with a, a thick decoction where you want that high concentration, or uh, if you're doing a mash out with boiling water or very hot water, or, you know, in the case of those special things. So I'd, I'd say it's a, it's a minor factor and okay to, to do if that gets you the, the results. It's not going to change the uh, balance of the beer too much. Mm-hmm. How about uh, John? Well, I think I think the only thing to add there is that with higher water ratios, um, if you are in a high alkalinity groundwater kind of situation with your brewing, um, your pH, your mash pH will uh, rise more in the brew in the bag system mm-hmm. with that high ratio than it would if in a traditional, uh, you know, one and a half to one, two to one, three to one kind of ratio. So the mash is um, going to be more alkaline at that point, I guess, right? Yeah, it'll be more alkaline, which um, it doesn't have a severe impact on efficiency in terms of uh, conversion because mm-hmm. the enzymes generally are are okay with pHs up to you know a pH of six. Um, but what you will notice is some change in the flavors of the you know the malts and the hops and so on and the wort that you're getting out of the process so yeah, brewing is a very robust process it's you're not going to sub- significantly impa- impact um, conversion efficiency yield or anything uh, you may notice a slight difference but I think you also uh, no, may notice depending on your water a slight flavor impact you know versus the traditional, more traditional methods. Mm-hmm. Is there a problem with enzymes in this case? Uh, I, I got this question the other day. Somebody asked me, uh, are you worried if you go too thin with a mash, do you not have enough enzymes to do the conversion? Uh, Randy, Generally, no. Oh, no. sorry. Go ahead. No, go yeah. ahead. Okay. Either one. <laughs> go ahead, John. Sorry. All right. Well, generally, no. Um, especially modern malts have uh, such high sti- diastatic power that unless you're using um, a lot of uh, starch adjuncts, mm-hmm in the mash, I don't think you should be impacted. Randy? Yeah, you and you wouldn't really want to do a high adjunct uh, process with a, with a brew in the bag kind of deal anyway. Right, you probably right. get a nasty mix, kind of a nasty <laughs> gel, gelatinous mix in there, so. Right. Uh, well, uh, going back to John's point, what about measuring and adjusting your mash pH? Um, how important is this, not just for brewing a bag, but, uh, but for mashing in general? Uh, let's start with John. Okay. Um, it's it's important, but I think it's that, um, you know, that last 10% of the process or, you know, of, of off, it's number 10 on the checklist of things to really pay attention to. Um, mm-hmm. You know, beer will happen. It's a question of uh, how uh, how good that beer can be. Uh, and the pH can definitely affect that. Um, so uh, I would, I definitely recommend that brewers measure pH um, in, but, the, in the mash, right? In the mash, and uh, but, you know, but it's it, again, it's not something to stress over. Um, you will make beer. It's just a matter of tweaking, you know, how how refined you want that beer flavor and how uh, how how well the efficiency of the extraction and so on proceeds. 
Yeah. Randy, Randy, what are your thoughts? Well, I've always been a bit of a minimalist on water, um, water chemistry, uh, not, you know, really not being a chemist and, or an engineer, uh, and trying to figure out what I thought, uh, what creates the most impact with the least amount of, of effort. And I've always really, I mean, I think it's definitely important to understand your own, your own water, whether it varies from season to season or week to week or whether, you know, what the alkalinity is, it is of it. And, uh, I think if you follow general guidelines for the amount of calcium that's necessary and the maximum amount of, of, uh, uh, alkalinity or, or, um, carbonate type minerals in there for any given beer style, you can do just fine with pretty minimal treatment. You know, most beers can tolerate a certain amount of, of carbonate until you get to the pale and hoppy beers. And then you kind of have to decide for yourself what's your limit for really uh, taking that seriously and treating it. For example, Chicago water, it's about 110 ppm of carbonate. Mm -hmm. And very few of the uh, professional brewers around the area uh, treat it at all, even for their IPAs. So doesn't necessarily mean that's what you should do, but you can make a passable, even a pretty tasty IPA with without treating water at that level. If it were twice that, you know, you'd, it would be a very different situation. I think most everybody kind of agrees, like 65, 70, somewhere is is uh, the ideal to get below for the, for those pale hoppy beers. Mm -hmm. And John, uh, we talk about measuring and then and then adjusting your mash pH. Since you can't really predict this in advance, um, how do you go about doing that, John? Um, well, I I recommend uh, you know having an understanding of your source water. Um, know what the residual alkalinity value of your source water is. That is, you know, subtracting. Um, the effect of hardness that is the calcium and magnesium from the alkalinity, total alkalinity number, and using that um, to kind of gauge how alkaline your mash will be as a result. Um, that's kind of the first step. And as Randy says, you know, you can get away with a really wide range uh, of alkalinity and, and brew good beer uh, with, you know, no matter what those numbers may be. Um, the, but in, you know, if you are trying to brew the best beer or, you know, win a competition, then, you know, taking, taking your understanding of, of alkalinity and pH and, and water adjustment to the next level can make that difference, um, and help you refine the flavor of the beer, It'd be, um, a little less coarse, a little more refined. Um, so how do you adjust it? Um, Frequently, um, acid additions to the mash or to the sparge water are some of the easiest things to do. For instance, let's say that your uh, total alkalinity of your water supply is 100, 100 ppm of alkalinity. You can neutralize that down to zero um, by adding two equivalents of acid, um, 100 uh, PPM is equivalent to two mm -hmm. equivalents of of carbonate or you know alkalinity. So by adding two equivalents of acid, um, then you can neutralize that right up front and take that out of the equation. And I explain how to do that in the water book. Yep, I just pulled it up for you. There's a water book uh, comprehensive guide for brewers uh, by you and Colin Kaminsky. Yep. <laughs> Everybody says it's really dry reading, but and I. Don't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, switching over from water. Um, let's talk about hop additions for a minute. Uh, a lot of early books advocate a bitterness hop addition, then a flavor hop addition, and followed by uh, perhaps a late hop addition. Or if we take this whole idea to the extreme, we can even have uh, something called continuous hopping. Um, and then in the other camp, we have uh, more recent research, which often advocates a bitterness and a whirlpool addition, but basically nothing in between. Um, so I was wondering on both of your thoughts on uh, continuous versus simple hop additions. And let's let's start with Randy for this one. Well, you know, the, the fact is that our our we can perceive taste and we can perceive uh, aroma, but our brain creates something called flavor. So really, when we talk about flavor hops, we're talking about aroma hops for the most part. And uh, I think 
the trend in commercial brewing and and I think also to some extent I know Brad you're you're kind of an advocate mm-hmm. of this too and I've been going this way is really just getting uh, your bitterness from a bitterness addition and then uh, uh, dropping the hops in at the end for for aroma and not worrying about hops at a half an hour and hops at 10 minutes and hops at five minutes or even doing the crazy uh, yeah. know, shed. I just don't think you get much benefit and it starts to get more com- complicated and confusing. And then you end up with five or 10 different hop varieties and you really don't know what you're doing with them all. And, uh, you know, we find it's just a lot better to, um, to just do the bitter, you know, really figure out how much hops you need for Whirlpool and where that's going to get you in terms of your overall bitterness, because you'd be surprised at how much bitterness you actually can pick up, especially commercial systems. I mean, we're getting over 20% utilization in our Whirlpool hops on a 15 barrel or 30 barrel system or 15 barrel system. So, or 30 barrel system. So it's quite a lot. And we're, we're actually making one beer where we don't put any kettle hops in at all because we want uh, I think about 40 BUs, but a big boatload of aroma. So that's what you got to do. Yeah, the problem I have with uh, some of these, you know, half an hour, 10 minute, 15 minute type additions is that you're really boiling off all the volatile hop oils at that point. So yeah. you're losing a lot of that flavor, I think. And there's some speculation that perhaps with first word hopping, you may be creating something called a hop glycoside mm-hmm. through that process that then could come out in your mouth when the saliva uh, liberates the the molecule of uh, hop oil from the sugar that it's bound to, and then that pops up into the back of your throat and gives you gives you flavor. But I think that's still, I don't know, maybe a little conjectural. Mm-hmm. Well, John, I wanted to get your uh, thoughts on this question. I'm I'm a bit of a traditionalist, I think, um, with regard to the three hop additions. You know, hour, half hour, mm-hmm. fifteen minute, ten kind. Of, zero kind of thing. Um, I do agree with you that re- you really can get uh, a majority of your a flavor and aroma from a, a Whirlpool edition or a, a hop stand, you know, a hop steeping at the end of the boil. Um, so many of the beers that we drink these days are, you know, IPAs. Um, and it seems... It seems that so many times when I have an IPA that has a wealth of aroma and uh, hop flavor to it, um, to me, I don't know, I'm kind of looking for uh, a little less flavor sometimes um, in terms of the, it's some of the, some of the beer flavors I've had are very much like chewing on a hop cone, which is not exactly the degree of flavor I'm looking for, but that's just me. Um, well, we're going, I, I, we're going way crazy with these IPAs, yeah. especially at the commercial well, level. They're one of the fastest growing segments of beer. Yeah, yeah. and I know that, I know that um, a lot of the commercial brewers who are making those very high alpha or very high, yeah, very high um, bitterness level beers are of necessity uh, going to um, isomerized extracts because they don't have the kind of nasty chlorophyll green taste that you get when you load up, you know, two pounds or three pounds of uh, hops per barrel into a kettle, not to mention right. the losses and things like that. So you can get a lot cleaner flavor. So I know, um, I know some home brewers are looking at that as well, but it's increasing trend. I think, is it Pliny that uses that technique? And I, I know a lot of the oh, yeah. West Coast yeah. MPAs are starting to, you know, do that for, for practical reasons, for cost reasons and for flavor reasons as well. Yeah, I, I think you, as you say, when you get up to a high alcohol and a very high bitterness, um, you can end up really wasting money putting that much hop into the mm-hmm. into the kettle, uh, trying to get that level of bitterness. When it's it's a lot easier to get, you know, to do ec- use isomerized extract for that that background bitterness, that backbone of bitterness, and then use all the fresh hops, the expensive stuff for uh, the flavor and aroma at the end. So, yeah, I think um, the stands, the late, the whirlpooling is is a very useful technique. Um, it's just a matter of personal taste, I guess, and how you want to apply it yourself. And it's amazing how different the beers are now as opposed to just five years ago or so. Yeah. You know, just finding e- even, you know, even a, a pale ale that used to be at, at 40 BUs is kind of perceived as pretty wimpy these days. And, uh, <laughs> I mean... You know, it's where we're at. 
Um, the, you know, one of the things I, w- I wanted to talk about, Randy, you, you only can perceive so much hop bitterness. Isn't that correct? And yeah, I mean, there's people going for, you know, 200, 300 IBUs type beers, um, but you can't perceive that real taste, can you? It's a bit of a black hole scientifically. You know, the most of the research in brewing is funded by the large producers. They have very little interest in finding out what a 100 BU beer versus a 200 BU beer tastes like. Um, but I do know we we did a recent. I was at some a, some training that uh, uh, Ray uh, Daniels at the Cicerone organization put on, and uh, we tasted s- some spike beers that were of different bitterness units. And the interesting thing was, is that we had a, a 60 BU and a 120 BU beer, and they tasted exactly the same for about the first 15 to 20, maybe a little longer seconds, and then after that, it was like. The other one just kept climbing, the, the strong one just kept climbing the hill and getting more and more and more bitter. So it's like if you're really paying attention to bitterness, you got to give it a little bit of time because it doesn't hit your mouth all at once like like a really salty mouthful of soup or something. Oh, interesting. Well, uh, at the other end of the extreme, we've got people that are brewing beers now commercially with just 100% Whirlpool hops. And I wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, on that technique. Uh, let's start with John. Um, wow. Yeah. I've, I get, I've had a couple of beers like that. Um, I, I don't like the, uh, a lot of the, the new tropical, uh, hops and I don't like the chlorophyll, uh, taste that you tend to get from, uh, the, you know, the whirlpool only editions. Um, and I think, you know, that's just, uh, my, my taste preferences, um, I've had some very, you know, some very wonderful beers that have are, you know, uh, mo- uh, many, much of the bitterness comes from late hopping, but uh, not. I guess I would just say they're not my favorite uh, use of hops. Mm-hmm. At, a uh, point, go ahead. at a certain point, it's really kind of you got to just do the math and figure out where you can end up. You know, we, we're making a at Five Rabbit, we're making a hoppy wheat beer, and like I said, we wanted it. A, about I think we come in about 38 BUs, but we wanted a massive amount of aroma. And we found that with that utilization that we're getting, that 20, 22% utilization in the kettle, we could not achieve the aroma levels we wanted uh, by and still have hops in the kettle. And, of course, we dry hop on top of that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That's even more problematic and expensive. So. Well, I think that level of bitterness lends itself well to an exclusively whirlpool hopped beer. I mean, I think it's when you're trying to do, you know, the strong IPAs where, you know, 100, 100 bitterness units and above, where you're trying to put in, you know, such a massive quantity of hops into the whirlpool to get that level of bitterness at 20% utilization, that I think you kind of overdo it on the chlorophyll flavors um, and the beer ends up tasting like chewing on a on a hop pellet, um, and and seeing needs to me it seems it, ne- it needs some of that boil to get some of those those uh, I don't know too raw volatiles to come off. Yeah. yeah, I think that's true. I mean, and I think it's also for homebrewers to realize that there's a huge difference in that, particularly in that stage. Uh, where as a homebrew utilization for a whirlpool, you might get, I don't know, five BUs or five um, percent efficiency or uh, or five percent use of utilization, maybe seven, eight percent. But you're not ever going to get 20 because you're not going to be whirlpooling for a half an hour. and You're not going to be four or five feet deep of work that's still probably at 100 or mm-hmm. 200 30 yeah. degrees down at the bottom for a long period of time. So it's just really very different. So it's probably not really that great a technique for home brewers compared to commercial brewers where it, where it definitely makes sense because of the. Yeah. Price. It seems like you'd almost have to hold the temperature at, uh, you know, I know it drops off very rapidly when you get below about 90 degrees C. So you'd almost have to hold right. the word at that temperature. If you want to get that kind of utilization. I would right. think. And then you're making DMS, you know, right. <laughs> yeah. so that's another problem, right? That's right. Okay, well, let's uh, switch topics again, and we'll talk. Uh, I got a question in about uh, uh, secondaries, and uh, you know, most of us were raised to traditionally do a secondary fermentation, but we're seeing more and more brewers now going with a single fermentation step and just uh, pulling it right out of that into the bottles. 
uh, thinking at the risk of actually transferring the beer and adding oxygen and all that is, is too high. Uh, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Let's uh, start with John this time. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I agree that uh, secondary fermentation is not needed uh, today unless you are doing you know, a, an actual secondary fermentation uh, with new ingredients such as fruit or um, some other uh, addition of fermentables to the fermenter. Um, I think the we used to talk about uh, using a secondary and racking from uh, racking off the yeast and to a secondary fermenter, mm-hmm. you know, 20 years ago when we were using uh, when we didn't have liquid yeast cultures readily available, uh, we and the the yeast packages we were, that we were able to buy were not well stored. I think you know. Yeast health, yeast handling, and management has come a long way, and it's kind of moved us away from the risk of autolysis that we used to try to uh, prevent by racking. And of course, you got to weigh that gain against the risk of oxidation or getting oxygen in the beer, as well as uh, getting bacteria in there, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you agree, agree, Randy? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, there are there's a closed blow off method. Chris Graham taught me that. Uh, from beer beer that's you know he you can basically transfer it without having a lot of exposure to air but um, really unless you're doing a beer that needs an exceedingly long time to uh, to age out or or as John says you're you're doing fruits or some some ingredient that needs to settle out you're better off just staying in one carboy we at Siebel mm-hmm. when we, we do some homebrew stuff with at Siebel and we don't really like to use the term secondary because um, it's not really representative of what's going on. I mean, it's basically maturation or conditioning, and there isn't really a secondary fermentation going on. So, so we kind of don't talk about that term. But, but uh, you know, if you're pulling that beer out of that carboy within about three, four weeks, you're you're really probably not going to uh, pull off much of the way of nasty flavor. Now, what if you're going with a lager though that has to actually ferment a little bit longer? What are your thoughts on that, Randy? Uh, I, I think it's sort of a matter of temperature. Um, I've never really brewed a lot of lagers myself. Uh, so I don't have a huge uh, volume of experience. I think if I was, uh, really making a, a, a Doppelbach or something, I'd be inclined to, uh, pull that off of the initial uh, fermentation dregs after a, a couple of weeks and, and throw it in a clean carboy and let it go. John, have you brewed, uh, brewed some lagers recently? I, I did a couple, I guess a year ago. And uh, I didn't those. They they spent the whole time in the in the primary. Um, I Jamil and I have talked about this on Bruce Strong as mm-hmm. well. And I think we or he I should say he advocates uh, not racking um, that from from his point of view. You should be able to pitch enough yeast to do the job in one week. Um, that there's no need, you know, the beer is done fermenting in one week. Um, mm-hmm. And so that everything after that is just clarification, kind of more mechanical um, fermentation processes, you know, settling out, flocculation, and so on. Right. So, um, so unless, you know, you need to, you know, you need to store the keg or the carboy, you know, for a long period of time on the yeast, there's no really... Uh, no reason to rack it um, before packaging, mm-hmm. assuming that's going to only be a couple of weeks, you know, in that fermenter. Well, uh, we, related to that, we've we've been, we learned quite a bit about improving clarity over the last few years. Do you guys have a few tips on improving the clarity of your finished beer? Let's uh, start with John. Um, yeah, clarity. I think I think one thing we've learned uh, or is. As homebrewers, we've learned learned a lot in the last few years is uh, minimum calcium. Uh, calcium helps uh, um, the flocculation of the yeast. It helps the uh, coagulation of trube and proteins in in the in the beer after fermentation. And so, I think a minimum calcium level is is one is part of the equation in terms of getting good clarity in beer using you know, Irish moss and other finding agents uh, are your other tools. Uh, and over to you, Randy. 
Well, like so many things in brewing, I think if you generally adopt the best practices, uh, those things that John was just talking about, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that they, you've got good yeast health, uh, that your temperatures are correct, that, uh, you know, all of that. And uh, generally, clarity is not a huge issue. Beer, and, and, we're, and we're not, again, we're not in a commercial situation where we got to get the beer out of the tanks today. Uh, so filtration doesn't make sense for home brewers as a general rule. Uh, mm -hmm. I know some people who make a lot of English style cask ales and they really like the Isinglass uh, for that purpose. It's a very traditional product and uh, works really nicely for that. And you can get a very nice bright uh, beer in the cask. Uh, but, uh, you know, for, for most uh, purposes, you know, you, just best practices will take care of the problem. Okay. Uh, well, both of you have been big advocates uh, in simplifying your recipes and really using only what's needed, i.e. having a reason for every, uh, every flavor that you add. Uh, I was wondering if you could both expand on these issues. Let's start with Randy. Well, I think uh, we tend to, um, I don't know, we're sometimes a little superstitious about uh, recipes and maybe we've got a lucky grain that we always like to use. Uh, I, know, I know that people tend to be a bit habitual about things. We have gotten into a habit in, in our brewing culture in the in the U.S. because so many so much of this started out with people using a lot of uh, cans of cans of extract and having to compensate for uh, the shortcomings of stale extract by adding caramel malt or crystal malt. That it's sort of a habit that that home brewers got into, and then I think uh, commercial brewers got into a little bit as well. So that's one of the things that kind of almost. Um, symbolizes American homebrewing recipes is a pretty heavy reliance on crystal malt. And I am always, you know, my, my big thing is that people, I want them to be deliberate. You love crystal malt, by all means, use it in every beer, but don't just use it because you always use it. You know, you really want to think about every ingredient, think about proportionality, you know, half an ounce of Munich malt in a stout is not going to get you anything. Right. So you have to think about these ingredients in terms of their flavor intensity and use them appropriately, use them style appropriately or not style appropriately, but just be aware of what you're doing. And John? Yeah, that's a very good point Randy has. I mean, I think I think I'm guilty of that too. And you know, I including crystal malt and most every style is uh at least some is some small part, um, just because that's kind of the way I was brought up on it. Um but yeah, if you know, a lot of home brewers will say, you know, my my beer is under attenuating, or uh, mm -hmm. or you know, it's I'm not getting the body that I'm looking for. Um, I th I think, as Randy says, you know, you need to be deliberate. You need to have a purpose for each ingredient, and if uh, you know, if if you're not getting the attenuation in the recipe that you want, then, you know, look to, look to your yeast. Um, don't put in the caramel malt, uh, you know, that's, you know, to contribute unfermentables. Uh, that could be part of the problem. Um, I, th I think, you know, in general, you know, you're only going to taste two, maybe three key flavors in a, any beer recipe. So, Limiting, you know, uh, when you're creating that recipe to kind of limit your ingredients to what do I want my key flavors to be? Is it is it a, a caramel sweet note or not? Is it a biscuit note? Um, is it a, a roasty coffee note? Or do you know? Or do I want the hops to come to the fore in this recipe? Um, you know, if if you're brewing a very hoppy beer, there's no point in putting in you know five different specialty malts trying for complexity, because uh, you're you're really not going to find them uh, if if it's just a strong hoppy beer. So, yeah, another little not to really jump on the bashing uh, crystal malt bandwagon, but uh, they are strongly implicated in beer staling. Uh, they contain a lot of reductone compounds, especially the ones in the sort of uh, 50, 60, 70 love of bond area uh, that cause a lot of those stale cardboardy flavors. Uh, so if you're working on a barley wine, you want to age for considerable pe considerable period of time, you want to probably be especially cautious about uh, too much mid-colored uh, crystal malt. And you've, uh, you've been a big advocate also of being very careful, especially of the darker crystals. Um, can you talk about that, Randy? Well, uh, they're they're very powerful as far as flavor. You know, one thing that's really fun to do is just 
go to the home homebrew store and buy little bits of several different kinds of crystal malts and try them all because every manufacturer's ones are very different. But um, as John says, you know, they do have some caramelly flavors. Then they, as they get darker, they go in more raisin and then kind of dark sort of burnt raisin, like the raisin on the bottom of the oatmeal cookie. And then, uh, then you kind of get to a point where they start to taste like burnt marshmallows and uh, kind of a classic flavor in a red ale so if you're making a red ale, that burnt marshmallow is sort of the key uh, malt flavor uh, uh, note in there. But you got to be aware of that that that's 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 there. And uh, now, well, on the other hand, we use some very dark, some 150, 170, even 190 caramels in some of the beers at Five Rabbit, and we get a beautiful chocolatey note out of this 170 uh, caramel malt that looks looks like black malt, but it's uh, actually a caramel. We get it from a, a malting company in uh, Chile called Patagonia quite delicious nice um well i wanted to ask uh, also about flavor design and i know um john you were we were doing the videos last year you were comparing right. uh, uh the design approach of recipes to uh to building a sandwich i thought maybe uh maybe you talk for a minute about that analogy sure yeah i think i think sandwich recipes are a good analogy for beer recipes because um you know generally in a sandwich you're looking for uh, a, like one or two key uh, flavors, you know, a meat and a cheese or, um, you know, mustard and pickle or, you know, it's a very uh, known combinations. Um, you can, you know, and if you overdo any one ingredient in a sandwich, um, you know, you've kind of ruined that sandwich. Like, you know, you say, oh, yeah, I like mustard. So I'm going to put, you know, a half cup of mustard in this sandwich <laughs> You know, that's that's all you taste. It's the same as like overdoing your hops in a recipe, overdoing your crystal malts in a recipe. Um, you want because you know, again, like a sandwich, you want the bread and the flavor of the bread to be a very significant part of the experience. Same within beer. Um, you know, the base malt is you know the backbone of the beer, and it should be the the main flavor that you're tasting now then your specialty malts are just going to be accents you know to enhance the flavor of the base malt makes sense um randy could you talk a little about your flavor approach your new book uh, mastering homebrew which you just released uh, has a very heavy emphasis on designing beers to target a particular flavor yeah, I do like the sandwich analogy, and I think somebody's even made a ham on rye beer with smoked malt and, and rye, which is pretty funny. So it'd be interesting to have a sandwich beer con competition sometime. But, uh, you know, I like I don't like I don't like brewing by lists. I don't like like opening up the brew logs and just start filling in the lists. You know, I always want to step back and and roll it around in my mind about like try to try to visualize it you know what am i really trying to achieve here trying to imagine that flavor and i think this is something that comes with experience as a brewer you get more familiar with your ingredients you understand the processes and the yeast better to be able to really vision envision that finished beer and now you're really adding like okay where do I get that biscuity flavor? Where do I get that clean maltiness? Where do I get that slightly raisiny accent? And you start building the recipe based on what your um, mental image of it is rather than, okay, I got to put some base malt in. Oh, I got to put some middle color malt. Maybe I need some dark malt. Uh, if you, you know, again, it's just about being more purposeful and more um, thoughtful about what you're doing and trying to trying to picture it in detail and sort of roll it around in your mouth and your mind, if that makes sense. Uh, and then execute by way of the recipe and, 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 uh, all the other techniques that you need to do to make beer. Yeah. I think another concept you uh, emphasize in your book is brewing with both halves of your brain. <laughs> I thought that was a good one. Um, well, can you talk a little about that? Well, I think it's pretty obvious to anybody who's ever tried it. You know, it, it, it's it's an art form that requires a, a lot of science and, and engineering type of thinking in order to make it happen. So, so you, you know, it, but on on the other hand, it it is ultimately about psychology and ultimately about what about people's feelings and about people's uh, preferences and, mm -hmm. and and the the mysterious world of the way flavor impacts our brains so there's nothing really engineering about that so so you know it, it and it's really just uh 
you have to use both. And I think I think engineers are drawn to that because they don't necessarily get to be as artistic as they might like in their professional life. And I and as an artist, I really like uh, working with numbers occasionally and and uh, some of the surety that you get from from working within a particular biological uh, chemical system. So I think it you know offers that attraction for a certain type of person that's drawn to home brewing that really likes to exercise their whole brains. Well, John, I want to give you a couple minutes here at the end to, to share any closing thoughts or tips you might have. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I think uh, the last year I've been, you know, with the water book coming out and so on, um, people starting to get a little wrapped around the axle with, uh, you know, calculating everything, and calculating pH and trying to add salts and so on to hit a particular pH. Um I want to discourage that. Um, the I think you need, you know, as a brewer, um, you need to think about your beer as food. Um, you know, beer and brewing is food and cooking. So you don't 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 oversalt your food. Don't oversalt your beer either. Um, you know, take a step back. You know, use the sandwich analogy or whatever. But you know, think about. Uh, how this beer is going to come together. Um, brewing's a robust process. You don't have to push it that hard. Uh, beer will happen. And, uh, you know, uh, be discreet, you know, small changes. Um, if you're in the pursuit of, you know, big flavor, uh, less is more and so on. Uh, Randy, I wanted to get your closing thoughts. Well, just a final tip. Um, is that I think people need to put as much effort into their uh, ability to taste and understand the flavors that are in beer as they do into the uh, water chemistry or mash chemistry or equipment or any other aspect of it. I think it's something that, um, I mean, it's sort of, we all kind of generally sort of know that, but I think that if you're, if you are, aiming to be a really great brewer and you're not a BJCP judge, somebody needs to smack you upside the head. And, uh, you know, because you really need to get in a serious program like that into a formal judging situation to really develop the judging, the, the tasting chops and vocabulary and techniques that you're going to need to move your beer, uh, up into that quality realm that you right. hope yeah, John and I, I have said this, but uh, most of the best brewers we know are also uh, really good beer judges. Yeah, you can't not be. Right. Uh, well, thank you both for, for appearing on the show. Really appreciate you being here. John, uh, thank you. Sure. Pleasure to be here. Happy 100th. Yeah. And Randy, uh, thank you for appearing on this uh, special episode as well. Yeah, it's a huge honor and uh, great to be here with John. We'll see you at the AHA conference, right? I'll yep. definitely be there. Yeah, John will be there. Uh, again, uh, the, well, well, we'll be at the AHA conference, which is coming up in June. And I I think there were still a couple openings uh, as of now anyways. So um, so, uh, so look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, thanks again to uh, Randy Mosher. He's the author of Mastering Homebrew, a uh, new book by him, as well as John Palmer, the author of How to Brew and uh, the How to Brew video series. Uh, appreciate them both joining me this week. You can find their books and videos on Amazon and at many homebrewing and bookstores. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Well, a big thank you to John Palmer and Randy Mosher for joining us for a special episode number 100. They've been great supporters of the Beersmith Podcast over the years. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, where you can get your 15% discount on their magazine or anything in their store if you use the offer code BEERSMITH2015 when you shop at beerandbrewing.com. Again, use the offer code BEERSMITH2015 and get your subscription now to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine at beerandbrewing.com. And also, Bruja, the Bruja BIAC, is an all-in-one stainless brewing system that takes up less space, requires less time, and gives you amazing control. Check out this new system at Bruja Equipment. Again, that's brujaequipment.com. Finally, if you haven't seen the trailers for the How to Brew DVDs that John Palmer and I released a few months ago, please go to beersmith.com slash DVD and check them out. And that's beersmith.com slash DVD and check them out. They are simply the best videos to get you started brewing all grain or extract today. 
Thank you for supporting the Beersmith podcast these last four and a half years, and thank you for listening in to Beersmith episode number 100. I hope you have a great brewing week. 